Hello everyone, Jonathan here with one of the largest guns we're ever going to feature on this channel. Um, this is the Hispano 20mm cannon, which is a Mark II. Uh, this is the most commonly produced during the Second World War. This is probably why people have heard of the Hispano. It's so huge, it doesn't even fit on the table, but we'll try and do some um, <laughs> movie magic to show you the whole thing. Uh, the important bits I need to talk about are within easy reach of me, though. So that there is that. So this is so a cannon. I suppose I should briefly explain what, what a cannon is. You probably know what a cannon is intuitively. Uh, the big things on pirate ships, that kind of thing. Uh, we do have quite a lot here, actually. This is not that. This is something that is sometimes termed an auto cannon, And it actually comes from the French. Um, and this gun was named in French initially. Uh, cannon. <laughs> and that's the, you'll have to ask the French as to why they cho chose that word. The British nomenclature was just gun or even machine gun sometimes. Um, but the word cannon from the French stuck pretty quickly to this, and we still use it today for things. Basically, 20 millimeter and above, cannon or auto cannon. And they are these big, slow, punchy guns uh, that let you tear big holes in aircraft, vehicles, that kind of thing. And 20 millimeters is the threshold. So under the NATO nomenclature, at least, up to 20 millimeters is a small arm. Bigger than that is what's called a light weapon. And one such light weapon is the cannon. And for many, this is the iconic cannon or auto cannon, the Hispano. However, it wasn't the first. Uh, the Erlikon predates it. Also very capable design. But the, uh, the guys at Hispano Suiza thought it wasn't good enough. And they decided they were going to replace it with what became this gun. Uh, its commercial designation, the HS404, HS for Hispano Suiza. And it's a design by a Swiss gentleman called Mark Birgit. Uh, please forgive my pronunciation, as ever. And uh, drawing on an unusual unlocking system that I will uh, vaguely gesture at later on. But before we go back into the technical side, I do want to hand over to our friends over at the Imperial War Museum who ha are able to provide us with a bit more context because they have the aircraft. We have basically all the guns. They have all the aircraft. It seems logical to hand over to them and you'll see me again shortly. Welcome to a very windy and wet Duxford where we are here in Hangar 2 with Spitfire Mark 5C JG891. The first Spitfires equipped with cannons were a disaster. They were delivered to number 19 squadron, which in itself had been the RAF's first ever Spitfire squadron, and it was based here at RAF Duxford. By the time the squadron gains cannon armed Spitfires, they've moved down the road to RAF Falmere, and the cannons have to be mounted on their side to fit into the very thin Spitfire wing. By mounting them on the side, the feed is poor and the ejector system equally so, meaning that the cannon regularly jams and stops. The aircraft's so bad that the pilots actually request back their original Spitfires, which are clapped out in comparison to these new machines. And it's not until the advent of the Mark V Spitfire, in the example we see behind us, where the cannons are mounted in the wing under that blister, that the problems are solved and the cannon becomes a really useful weapon in the RAF's arsenal. So let's take a closer look. We're standing here with a Mark 5C Spitfire, the C designating the wing. A C wing or universal wing could be equipped with a mixture of weapons, including 303 machine guns and 20 millimeter cannons. This particular example has a pair of 20 millimeter cannons in each wing. However, this aircraft itself is fully airworthy. So much so, in fact, it took part in the Duxford Air Show just last weekend. And as such, the cannons themselves are not in the wing. They weigh a lot and they would uh, degrade the performance of these aircraft. Some aircraft do still fly with 303 machine guns or replicas of, but very, very few are equipped with a cannon. Underneath the wing, the cartridge ejector ports have been blanked over to avoid drag but we can still see evidence of where the 20 millimeter cannons would be through the barrels protruding from the front of the wing and the large blister up on top. Cannons were important because on the early Spitfires equipped only with rifle caliber machine gun bullets, they found that they didn't have the hitting power to take down the increasingly heavily armored German bombers. Cannon would have given them that potential 
And the aircraft we've got here is a Mark 5C. The C wing allows for a combination of armaments in the wing, including 303 machine guns and cannon, most of which would have had a single 20 millimeter and two 303, as the pilots were preferenced to firing the machine gun first, to sight the weapons, to note that they were on target before opening fire with the harder hitting and more potent 20 millimeter cannon. So that's all from me here at Duxford. Back to you, Jonathan, at Royal Armouries. So design work on this replacement for the Erlikon, spoiler alert, they didn't end up replacing the Erlikon. That remained in service well into the post-war period. Uh, began in 1933 at uh, Hispano Suiza. Uh, in case you're wondering about the name, Hispano, Spain, Suiza, Swiss. They are in fact Spanish, Swiss in origin, but the factory they constructed to actually build these things was in France, just to confuse matters. This thing being absolutely immense, this is 7.9 feet long, um, which is astonishingly long. That's in large part because this thing had to pass through the engine block of the Hispano Suiza 12Y, which was the model number, aero engine. They were trying to corner the market here by producing a new aero engine that was compatible with, or well, the gun was designed around uh, that engine, and it had to be that long to reach through the engine block and through the spinner and fire through the spinner. So that's the only reason this thing is so long. And in fact, skipping ahead to the end of the story, the Mark V Hispano, totally redesigned, is much, much shorter because it didn't need to be that long. That made it a lot, a lot lighter as well. But I'm getting ahead of myself there. <laughs> the Brits were stuck with this super long, super heavy gun and you needed at least two in the aircraft to have any real effect. And the weight of this thing as well, 106 pounds, you, you factor that up by two guns. Then you have some sort of feed device, which is what these guys are, which I'll explain in a second. Then you've got belts of ammunition, which weigh considerably more than the old 303 rifle rounds that they are sort of replacing. Um, the first RAF aircraft to actually be fitted with, the, with this behemoth is actually the Westland Whirlwind, which is a very interesting twin engine fighter. Uh, but of course, the famous story is the attempt attempted and then successful integration with the Spitfire. Um, the first experimental flight being not wildly successful, I think 30 rounds fired before it jams. Um, oh, well, one gun jams and the other <laughs> gun jams as well. And if you, as they initially did, arm your Spitfires with just these two cannon that are unproven, unreliable, you are then completely unarmed. And this is how we go to this mixture of 303, four 303 Browning, so we halve the armament of uh, 1150 round per minute 303 Brownings but they're a, they're a very capable backup in the event that these don't work and you've got more rounds on the aircraft to, to shoot if you need to and that's that mixed armament from the Spitfire 5B onwards uh, that proves to be the winning combination uh, because we really are here looking at lots of little holes versus fewer very large holes <laughs> caused by these absolute monsters here. So that it's quite the upgrade in firepower from tiny little rifle rounds that are essentially just normal lead bullets with copper jackets with a few tracers thrown in to belts made up of these two rounds. So we've got armor piercing incendiary or semi armor piercing incendiary technically and high explosive incendiary blowing great big holes in the aircraft um, and sadly in the crew as well. Um, if you can land a hit, these, this thing is firing at a considerable rate, 650, sorry, 750 rounds per minute going down to 650 with the Mark II gun, which is what this is. So, but it's, it's not a bum, bum, bum. It's like a, not like a pom-pom where you might miss, you know, every shot you fire has a big gap between it and the next and the plane can fly through it. It's not quite that. It's still high rate of fire. 750 is considerable. Same sort of rate of fire as an AR-15. So you've still got a good chance of hitting, but not as much chance as Swarm of Angry Bees at 1150 rounds per minute. So that's, that's the background as to why you would move to such a, a big gun. And the, the RAF and um, sort of by extension the fleet air arm are, are very keen to do that. Speed becomes a problem and this dovetails directly into the unreliability of the gun in the air. So initially they go for this absolutely ridiculous 60 round drum. 60 rounds is a lot less than 300 per gun for the Browning, needless to say. 
and even at 800 rounds, per, um, oh, sorry, 750 rounds per minute, you are um, still going through them pretty quickly. So not many seconds of firing at all. They're also quite slow to reload, rearm, because you've got a there's a, re a removable handle for this that we don't have sadly. You have to clip on, unlatch the the, the mag. This is the latch here. I'm not going to attempt to fit these speed devices because it's too difficult from this angle, I'm afraid. And so you're having to, to hoik the whole thing out, slap a, a new one in. Um, it's also not su superbly reliable with all the rounds contained in a drum. Those of you who, who've been watching our videos before will have picked up on the fact that drum magazines generally are not hugely reliable. Box magazines are good. Internal magazines are good. Clips are good. Belt, direct belt feed is superb, box magazines aren't great. So with the Mark 5C Spitfire, 5B is the first one to be successfully integrated with um, the Hispano gun and this magazine system. But with the Mark, with the Mark 5C, different wing, uh, they move to a belt drive system. So this is actually a later belt drive system, sadly. We don't have the, the, the main wartime type, but it's very similar. And it is a clockwork. The, the IWM have footage of the armourers cranking these things to wind them up. So it's still clockwork, like like the drum would be. But it's just a it's a more reliable system. In here are multiple sprockets. You can actually see them through this door, hopefully. So it's a quite a very positive feed. So you're putting all your spring tension on ahead of time. But once they're in the gun and firing. you are actually topping up that spring tension via this, this little piston doohickey here. <laughs> That's getting pushed up and it's a rack and pinion and it's reapplying spring tension so that you've got positive drive of the belt through the gun, if that makes sense. Unlike a lot of belt fed guns, the Hispano doesn't pull the belt through the gun with a belt, with a pull system. It relies on some external speed system. And you might argue that's a, a disadvantage, but in a way it makes it more flexible and upgradable, and that's exactly what they did. So the belt drive is what you'll see in the Mark 5C Spitfires onwards, uh, also in the Hurricanes, the Typhoons. It's more compact, as you can see, and this is why if, you, if you're a modeler or an aviation fan, you'll have seen the great big bulge they had to put in, the, in that beautiful thin Spitfire elliptical wing in order to fit this puppy in there. <laughs> Whereas this makes it more compact and it allows you to rotate the gun back upright like this. Because one of those major reliability issues they had was you cannot fit, just, I'll just plonk that on the top like that, you cannot fit the whole thing, that does not fit in a Spitfire wing. The only way it fits is on its side. And even then you need great big bulged fairings to accommodate this, this mag. Putting the gun on its side induced speed problems, because you're going to be doing most of your firing on the, on the level, and so with this thing hanging off the side, you're inducing friction. Um, you've got these great big, well, especially the mag, great big heavy thing full of heavy rounds that has to move back and forth. Why is it moving back and forth? Well, I mentioned the belt drive getting topped up. Well, the only way you could do that is if the whole gun is moving, and luckily, the whole design principle of the Hispano is the whole gun recoils back and forth. Again, you can find on the Imperial War Museum collection page footage of these things firing, and it's a significant, about 20 millimeters, the whole gun, by coincidence, the whole gun's recoiling between 20 and 23 millimeters um, back and forth within the wing as you fire the, the gun. The mag, or the belt drive, <laughs> depending which system you're using, has to stay put, and it stays put there initially through inertia. It's literally sat there, it stays put, the gun recoils under it. Now that broadly works, but if there's any kind of drag or pressure induced on this system, it's gonna cause this to not, this sliding part here, I don't know if you, hope you can see, this is that, this is where your magazine fits, or later your belt feed mechanism, and that whole thing is moving back and forth quite a significant distance, so that, in the reality of the gun, as it were, stays put with the feed mechanism, the gun is what moves, and the aircraft stays still relative to those. Hopefully that uh, makes some sense. 
This means that the gun has to have, as well as a return spring for the bolt in here, which is what this braided, twisted spring here is that I'm pointing at, and a buffer spring to stop it beating itself to death because it's so powerful, literally just to, to give it something to, to run into, like a train, like the buffers at the end of a train track. Those two springs, those are, those are normal. Most guns have some analog to those. It also has to have that nonsense at the end with the gigantic coil spring and various different tubes and thread protectors and initially a recoil reducer because there's so much recoil going on, you need a muzzle brake slow that recoil down. So there's a bewildering array of, the, of that setup, those different setups. They're called front mounting unit. I won't bore you to death with those. If you really want to know, drop us an inquiry, <laughs> or maybe I'll be able to write this up in an article. Um, every aircraft had its own front mounting unit. Uh, different spacers, different screw on bits at the end, usually just a thread protector once we get away from the recoil reducer. I can show you a picture of that setup with the recoil reducer because it's the prototype and the early Spitfire setup. Well, not that early, it's around for a while. Where we get rid of that slotted muzzle brake recoil reducer thing is when the belt feed system comes, the belt drive system comes in. Because that needs more recoil to drive it, to top up that spring tension I was talking about. And so they, they, get, a, they, move that, they get rid of that. Now, from the outside of the aircraft, you don't really see much. You see that slotted recoil reducer on the early gun, uh, on the early, early aircraft. Once that's removed, all you see is that little hex nut, or later on, just two flaps on the end of it. But you still, you put a spanner over it to remove the nut. That's all you see on the end of a Spitfire's gun, because everything else is fared in. It's called a fairing. It's various different shapes over the life of the Spitfire. Uh, on the, his on the um, Typhoon and the Hurricane, it's quite exposed. They sort of wear their underpants on the outside of their costume, as it were. And you see that great big coil spring. Early on, it's a flat coil spring. Uh, on this gun, it's the later round section spring. And then there's a shorter round section spring later. The main take home message here is if you see a Hispano in a museum, including ours, <laughs> it's wrong at the front. Because post-war and late war, they were set up for different aircraft. And every aircraft, in theory, had its own setup. That's all about how it fits into those fairings and how it accommodates that recoil of the gun. That is absolutely essential to how it works. Up to 23 millimeters uh, travel, as I say. So I go into detail on that because it's a unique feature, essentially, or not unique, but um, pretty unique to the, to the Hispano. So we know the gun recoils. Um, and it is, in fact, a form of blowback operated, believe it or not. I'm currently hanging on to the gas piston though. So what's that about? Well, <laughs> the way this works, this was a system designed by Carl Swabilius, I think his name was, American 1919. And he patented a system, uh, this locking system here that we'll come to, where you use gas. So this is a fairly conventional gas piston, gas tube, gas block setup. And you can see here the end of the piston, much like an AK or something, looks like a, a long stroke gas piston isn't. This is a gas unlocking system, which is why the travel up here is so minimal. So this great big piston comes back, gas is capped off here after the, as the projectile passes this, this gas block, comes back into this block, shoves this massive external piston backward. I can't even replicate that because I don't have the muscles, but you can see it would move if I was a 20 millimeter round. This gives a great thrust to these, there are two of these, one on my side, one on your side, these, these rods here, those push back on the bolt carrier and unlock the bolt. But still with a tremendous amount of residual gas pressure in the chamber, that's where the blowback takes over. So gas unlocked, blowback operated. That's the, the secret of, of how this works, as it were. Not that many systems use that. Not recoil operated like the Browning that, that lives in the wings with this. So from the Mark V um, Spitfire onwards, um, we, the, the standard loadout is four Brownings in 303, the, the, the proven, somewhat reliable recoil operated guns, and two of these big suckers pumping out these uh, explosive and armor piercing 
round. I'll just show you how the unlocking is achieved. So we imagine that this great big piston has given a, a thwack to these two rods. And we have a hand cocking system of sorts fitted to this gun. This was not hand cockable normally. This was pneumatically operated. Both the cocking tube on the side, which is on the right side, and the sear release, which is a separate unit that fitted to the bottom, both operated by pneumatics. But I can give this a yank, the cocking tube, and you can see the bolt comes, or the bolt carrier, I should say, comes to the rear. and drags the bolt itself open. So you have that short amount of dwell time. I've left it partly open there. Uh, that gives it enough time for the so initial drop of pressure and then uh, the blow back of the bolt to start to happen. So it gives you an idea of, of what's happening inside, hopefully. I can't pull it too far. And I'll have to give it an assist forward again. This is full of old grease and that's it locking back into position. There's one more piece of the puzzle here, uh, apart from the pneumatic cocking on the side, that's the pneumatic sear release. So there's no trigger, there's no spade grip, obviously, um, and it's not uh, the same twin pneumatic firing system of the Browning. Check out our Browning video again if, you're, if you want to see how that works. The Hispano only has one pneumatic firing control, and it's this. This is the sear release mechanism. It fits at the back, bolts on, under the gun, and I think you can, but you can sort of intuitively see sort of how it works. It has a plunger here that is forced up by air pressure to drop the sear. It's as simple as that. There's more detail to the mechanism, but we won't, we won't go into it now. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Your pneumatic hose, that braided armoured type of pneumatic hose, just like the Browning, attaches here. Uh, where this, this protective cap is. Air pressure goes in there, drives this plunger back, and actually um, that bears on, on, the, on the sear and allows it to fire. So this is essentially your trigger mechanism. There's even a safe fire control here. You have to pull out the, the plunger, and you can manually set this thing to safe. Uh, this one's a bit stiff. So it's, it's on fire. It's not something you'd want to mess about with, with the gun installed uh, in the wing. These were often serviced in situ because you need the aircraft's pneumatic system to actually cock the thing. There's you can't use your forage cap as they, as they did with the Brownings and yank on the cocking stud. You've got to have this hooked up to the aircraft. Now, there's a lot of focus on the gun on its side as, as the source of, of problems. Um, some of that is said to have been the flexing of the wing. I, I don't doubt that because that's going to induce friction between the magazine, the magazine carrier that slides and the gun. I think the main issue with it being on its side is the, is the ejection of spent cases. Until they redesigned the chutes to carry those empty cases away from the action, you were getting stoppages from that as well. But even that isn't the whole story because I found um, 120 modifications were required to the, to the Mark I and II Hispano guns. They're almost, they're basically interchangeable. They're, they're upgraded in parallel. The Mark I is made until 1943. So regard the Mark I and II guns as essentially the same thing for this. Um, 120 mods to get that thing in, into reliable uh, working order. And then uh, that total went to 134, I believe it was, by 1941. So they're, they're fixing the problems the whole time. This is a relatively new gun, and it's a brand new integration with the Spitfire and the Hurricane to get, uh, and, and the, later the Typhoon get it working reliably. So some of the stoppages you might read about in accounts will be just will be to do with the two big problems with it being mounted on its side. But when you think aircraft are, might be firing from any sorts of angles, and they won't always be under load from G, some of those stoppages are from the gun itself getting fixed over time. But by the Mark 5B, you had a reasonably reliable setup um, where the gun is now working OK. You've got a, uh, the case ejection kind of handled but you still have residual issues from this, this feed mechanism set up. With the Mark 5C onwards and the, the later Hurricanes and Typhoons, well, the, the, the cannon-armed Hurricane and the Typhoons, which were cannon-armed anyway, they're using belt drive, which is like the final piece of the puzzle to make this thing 
truly workable and you know that your gun isn't just going to go click when you pull the trigger. Thanks so much for watching, guys. This has been a collaboration with our wonderful friends over at the Imperial War Museum. Definitely do go and check out their parallel video to this, which is covering uh, the whole uh, armament of the Spitfire. You might even see yours truly pop up in that one as well. Otherwise, of course, please do all the usual things, liking and subscribing and that stuff, and visiting our museums if we're able to do so. Check out our website, our new website, um, and various social media links there, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Follow along on our, with our What's This Weapon for next week, and we'll see you again next week.